So welcome everyone to this particular Zoom. So it's good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. And you're very welcome. I want to introduce our presenter for today, who's my namesake, Brother Kevin Colley. And just to give you a little bit of background about Kevin. Kevin is a Christian brother based in New York, member of the American province. And over many years, he's been involved in education and spirituality. And he has a great passion for eco-justice and care of the earth. And he represents ERI at the United Nations in New York. He's been a member of the ERI team since its beginning back in 2007, 2008. So he is a man of wide experience and he works with various committees and groups in New York. He publishes a very good newsletter called Carbon Rangers, which you are welcome to see. And that has been going on for many years and has got a large number of readers and followers. And he has a great passion for Laudato Si and for Pope Francis's work on Laudato Si and also for the SDGs. And he's, he has made connections between Laudato Si and the SDGs. At the United Nations, he's involved in groups that are dealing with mining dealing with also the, the recent uh, treaty about the oceans, and he keeps us all updated about that. So he's a director also of the Thomas Berry Forum for Ecological Dialogue, which is part of his work at Iona University, where he teaches in New York. So Kevin, we're delighted to have you with us again today, and we look forward to hearing your presentation on care of the earth. And we know that your passion for the Laudato Sea and care of the earth will come through in your presentation. So over to you, Kevin. Well, thank you very much, Tino. Thank you very much, Kevin, and welcome to everyone. Again, it's the same kind of a drill here. It's uh, good morning in New York and good afternoon and good evening wherever you are. Uh, I thank Tino and Kevin and the team in Geneva for inviting me to share on what I'm uh, going to present today. I'll put it out there as a um, an introduction, even though I think some of you may already know uh, uh, bits and pieces of all of this. Uh, it's it's clearly uh, based on Laudato Si and Care of Earth, and a lot of it has to do with my time at the UN in New York, attending various meetings, as has been mentioned. So that's the, the background for it. Uh, I'm hoping to go through the process, uh, starting with Laudato, looking at connections to the UN, and then we'll take some time, if you don't mind, on the the science behind uh, our predicament, and also some of the possible answers and responses. I'm also going to spend some time today explaining what I see as a situation that's going to need some addressing at the UN that may be, uh, in a sense, compromising its uh, its ability to operate freely. Uh, it has to do with the number of uh, international corporations that are showing up at UN uh, conversation. So that's a little bit more background. And at the very end, I will uh, put up a slide with uh, links to resources. And I think, Tino, you've already mentioned that this will be recorded so that if you're uh, trying to keep up and it's going too fast, not to worry because the slides will be available. Tino has the slides and uh, you can always get back to them if you need them. So I don't want you to feel pressured or be writing down things when you see things or hear things. It might be just as well to move through it quickly. And I think, Tino, we talked briefly about um, the chat box issue. And uh, I know that uh, at some point I'm going to take a little bit of a break, maybe 20 or so minutes in, and I'll just hold everything. Yeah. And maybe people at that point would like to ask a question or inquire or just say hello on the chat. So it'll be open for a little bit. And you and I can talk about how long we want to keep it open. And then I'll go back in and uh, continue the, the presentation. Is that okay? That's perfect. Okay. So we'll, we'll go in that route. If the uh, translators, if we have them on this call, uh, they want me to slow down, just let them know that they can reach me. No, me uh, this, this session is uh, in English. Uh, okay. It's the next session, which will uh, be interpreted also in Spanish. Okay. Fair okay. enough. Yeah. Then the only reason I'm concerned at this point is because I'm from New York and sometimes I talk too fast. <laughs> but we'll be okay, I'm sure. All right, so let me go get my slides and we'll start our work here.
Are we good? We can see that? Yes, perfectly. All right. So you can see our, our situation here with respect to where we're coming from. It's, uh, we're calling it Earth Care, and I have it as a subheading Laudato and the SDGs with United Nations engagement. So that's the broad painting that we're looking at this morning and this afternoon and this evening. Uh, we'll start with Laudato. The subtitle is On Care for our, of Our Common Home, Pope Francis. This was back in May of 2015. So you can see it's a couple of years now, eight years exactly. Uh, we're coming on the anniversary. There'll be a Laudato Sea Week uh, in May for celebrating. This is a picture of the Earth taken from the other side of the moon, one of our Apollo astronaut processes. The Latin is sig vos non vobis, meaning yes, for you, but not yours. It was a, a response by Virgil to one of his plagiarists. Yes, I'm doing this for you, but you don't have the right to keep it and do something else with it. So that's for us, for our earth care, for you, but not yours. A uh, picture of the text from uh, Pope Francis and a comment from him, uh, which is basically telling us this is for everybody. It's Catholic social teaching, but we have to be able to say to everyone, we need to acknowledge the appeal and the immensity and the urgency of the challenge we face. There are six chapters. The first chapter, what is happening? Good place to start. Then he works himself into the gospel of creation and the regard for creation that comes from his faith. Then we also start to look at the human roots. How did we get to this predicament? And a lot of it has to do with our own behavior as humans on the planet. Integral ecology has to do with how do we know what to do next? Well, one of the things we have to pay attention to is the fact that everything is connected to everything else. So it's integral ecology. There are lines of approach and action in the fifth chapter in terms of what's the best place to begin the work and how do we respond to what we know? And then the final chapter, ecological education and spirituality. Of course, as Pope, he would be concerned about the spiritual issues here. That's the longest of the chapters. In chapter one, we'll just do a quick uh, review. We won't take our time to read the whole document because of, of our time here. But I got little numbers after the, tap, the top uh, title there, one to 61. Those are paragraph numbers. So if you're trying to track something down in Laudato, you can find the paragraph. Every paragraph is numbered. It helps a lot for translations. So that's why we wanted to make sure you understood the numeration process. So what is happening? Chapter one presents the scientific consensus on climate change, along with a description of other threats to the environment, including threats to water supplies and biodiversity. We'll mention that right away, uh, biodiversity. This is taken from Laudato, it's the words of Francis, and he talks about the disappearance of thousands of species, uh, which we will never know, which our children will never see. They've been lost forever. And the great majority become extinct for reasons related to human activity. And uh, He's saying basically because of us, thousands of species will no longer give glory to God by their very existence, nor convey their message to us. We have no such right. And you see the Laudato Si reference, paragraph 33. It's a green encyclical and a social encyclical. He's making clear that we understand it's not just about care for the earth. It's also a social encyclical in terms of justice for everyone. We have to realize a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach. And his phrase for this is, it must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor. Uh, rather sad photograph there of young kids escaping the floods recently in Pakistan. Chapter two, you see paragraph 62 to 100, the gospel of creation. And he's acknowledging the complexity of the crisis and its many causes. And we have to be aware that we're not gonna get solutions in just one direction. We need to look at this whole thing holistically. And respect must also be shown for the various cultural riches of different peoples, their art and poetry, their interior life and spirituality. 
So he's talking about it from the point of view of the Catholic Church, but also acknowledging other faiths have uh, positions of energy that we might bring to bear. He talks about, if we're really concerned about this at ecology, uh, no branch of the sciences and no form of wisdom can be left out. It's all hands on deck. And he's making it clear that the church's social teaching represents a synthesis with regard to social issues. And now it's called to be enriched by taking up new challenges. Other popes have talked about care of the earth, but no one has done it in the complete and deepest way that Francis has. The poor suffer first, always <clears throat> in the upper right corner, there is a picture of some uh, goats who have come to the water hole and you can see it's gone, it's baked dry. In the lower left is an illustration, a photograph of Brazil. Uh, on the right is the forest, it used to be all forest, but on the left, it's been converted into alfalfa fields to feed cattle. So the poor suffer first from climate change. They suffer from sea level rise, severe weather, severe drought, desertification, deforestation, privatization of water, food insecurity, land grabbing, toxic dumping, extractive industries, species extinction. Inequality takes many forms. This is a photograph of Mexico City. Um, we use this because it's almost impossible, for example, to find a tree in that photograph. 20 million people live in Mexico City in those kinds of conditions. Inequality rears up in places uh, in India where you know it's a communal well and people have difficulty obtaining water. There may be 100 people in this photograph. Generally speaking, it's women who have the duties of collecting water for the family. We'll talk about inequality in gender later. Inequality also comes at the other end of the spectrum. <clears throat> uh, this is from Oxfam. They have kept track of these things. Eight men own the same wealth as the 3.6 billion people who make up the poorest half of humanity. I recall giving this presentation in other cases and, and the hand would go up in the room and somebody would always ask me, who are the eight men? I want their names. Uh, we won't do that today, but it is a, a concern. Chapter three, the roots of the crisis. This is paragraph 101, et cetera. And this is a piece of very strong language from Francis in, in, in Laudato. Uh, many have accepted the idea of infinite or unlimited growth, but this paradigm he says, is based on the lie that there is an infinite supply of the Earth's goods. And this leads to the planet being squeezed dry beyond every limit, paragraph 106. Uh, popes don't usually use that kind of language, but there he is. He says, it's a lie there's a, that there's an infinite supply of the Earth's goods. Chapter four, integral ecology. Uh, there's a picture there of uh, a large uh, excavator digging coal in Germany, and behind it, you can see the edges of a field that used to be there. We're faced with two separate crises. It's one's environmental and the other is social, but it's really one problem. He makes that clear. It's both social and environmental in chapter four. Common good is in chapter four. Now, common good is a long time expression used in the Catholic social teaching. And it's very important because I think what you'll see in a little while is it's not everybody who's working toward the common good. Underlying the principle of the common good is respect for the human person as such, endowed with basic and inalienable rights ordered to his or her integral development. You see the word integral again from Pope Francis. It has also to do with the overall welfare of society and the development of intermediate groups. So it's not just one person at a time, he says the common good calls for social peace, stability, security, a certain order, which cannot be achieved without particular concern for distributive justice. So that's where he's talking about the justice question in chapter four, where he talks about the common good. And he makes it clear wherever and whenever this is violated, violence ensues. People get locked out of what they see is rightfully theirs. Society as a whole and the state in particular are obliged to defend and promote the common good. In chapter five, we have intergenerational justice coming forward. 
And you can see paragraph 163 now, we're way up in the document. And he has a question for us at the end. Is it realistic to hope that those who are obsessed with maximizing profits will stop to reflect on the environmental damage which they will leave behind for future generations? A profound question, and he doesn't really get to answer it, but we'll have a, a look at that issue in a little while about maximizing profits rather than looking at damage. The chapter six, the long one, <clears throat> pardon me, is on ecological education, spirituality. Uh, another photograph of the recent Pakistan floods, people fleeing to higher ground if they can get to it. Uh, many things have to change, of course, but we human beings above all who need to change. He's very clear about that. The responsibility is on us. We, he says we lack an awareness of our common origin, of our mutual belonging and a future be, to be shared with everyone. So you see the words there, common origin, mutual belonging, a uh, future that's to be shared. There was a wonderful little celebration in Rome when uh, Francis uh, published out the uh, document. This is uh, 2015, this was sometime in June or July of that year. Many faiths, this was a, a parade almost sponsored by Green Faith and the Thomas Berry Forum at Ionian University sent a delegation and uh, we're in the celebration in the streets there. Uh, it was on the Sunday afternoon audience and the Pope uh, did acknowledge the, uh, the crowds. We were very happy about that. So there is something to celebrate, even though we're still in a predicament. There's a film we know about Laudato. Uh, it's called The Letter. If you haven't seen that, it's worth a look. I think I'll just jump out to the, to the link. You can see that on YouTube, there are a number of ways to get to it. There's the link on the left-hand corner there on the letter. So uh, that's uh, good to know about uh, in terms of our own, uh, you know, how to get back to that. Oops, I'm out of my Zoom now. That wasn't good. All right, Tino, I'll have to get back to this later. Okay. I'm going to have to put up the controls. Here we go. Are you trying to show the movie? No, I want. I just want to get back out of that. I'm sorry, I went that direction. Okay. I have uh, to get back to if, my room. if you just go to the bottom of your screen, you might see the uh, back button. No. No, it's not there. Okay. Then maybe just uh, stop sharing and start sharing. I'm back again. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. I'll jump not out. Problem. Not a problem. We'll get back in. Anyway, people know about the letter now. That's for sure. <laughs> there are now some links to the UN goals. Again, we're looking back at 2015. Sustainable Development Goals came up and they were being worked on for a couple of years in New York. And we talked about it from 2012 to 2015. The man in the picture there is the ambassador Macharia Kamau from Kenya. He was the co-chair of the process, wonderful man. He was very strong when the Laudato came out because he came out toward the end of that process. And he actually came into the UN chambers and held up a copy of Laudato Si and told everybody in the room, he's recommending it. Now you usually don't get uh, recommendations about faith groups in those rooms. It's not a good topic usually but he was very clear that he thought this was a very helpful document. That was in uh, May or June of 2015. We know that that was followed by the climate summit in Paris in December of that year. In that interval, Francis came to the UN on September 25th, 2015. There he is speaking to the General Assembly and they adopted the SDGs uh, that day. Uh, it was no secret that they were very impressed with him and they were happy that he was endorsing the SDGs. So that's when all of this came together. And then a few months later in December of that year, we got our Paris Climate Agreement. The goals you can see on the screen there, there are 17 goals, too many for us to spend a lot of time on, but basically you can see across the top line, they're the fundamentals of caring for people. 
uh, end poverty, end hunger, bring good health, get education, talk about gender equality. And number six, the clean water question. The second row, we talk about energy and jobs and infrastructure. Number 10 is reducing inequalities. 11 is communities and cities. 12, you can see that Mobius strip about a responsible consumption and production. We can't just make stuff and then throw it away. We need to figure out a way to keep things from piling up in our garbage. 13 was climate. 14 was water, basically life in the oceans. 15 was life on land. To put all these together, we needed uh, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Always need that. And then at the end of the conversation, they were realizing in all of this work, how do we pay for this? And that's where goal 17 came up. We need some partners to make this all real. Another way of looking at this is, and this is an exploded diagram, you can see that the biosphere is the basis for all the SDGs. The greens and the blues at the bottom of the screen there. The life on land, life in the oceans, uh, sustainable access to water and then climate action. All of that is what the foundation for the next layer up in society having to do with ending hunger, ending poverty, uh, better education, health, et cetera, the top level in terms of the economy about jobs and structures and inequalities. And the very top at the end of the circles at the top of the screen, the goal 17 again, again, how do we pay? for this, we need partners. So that's another way of looking at the sustainable development goals. We also wanna make the point that the goals are aligned with Catholic social teaching. The SDGs lay down the contours of the common good. They embody integral ecology. They are motivated by the virtue of solidarity, care for the poorest. They foster integral human development and they call for a more holistic sense of human flourishing, all of which is Catholic social teaching. So the, the goals haven't said that explicitly, but we can see the parallels in those documents. There's a certain uh, obvious concern about inequalities. That's goal 10, and there are targets for each of the goals. We'll give you a little sample of what this means. For uh, goal number 10, reduced inequalities, target 10.1 is reduced income inequalities bring people up, uh, social protection floor, for example, in terms of income. Uh, goal uh, 10 with target 10.2, promote universal social, economic, and political inclusion. Everybody should have something to say about their situation. And uh, goal 10, target 10.3, ensure equal opportunities and end discrimination. So you can see how the goals are parsed out and made more specific by the targets. The quality education goal, the language for that is very uh, inclusive. It says ensure inclusive and equitable quality education, promote lifelong learning opportunities for all. So it's not just about kids in school, it's about everybody getting a chance to keep learning. And then the gender equality uh, goal number five, uh, it's clear that gender is woven throughout the SDGs uh, because it sits at the intersection of economic issues, social issues, and environmental issues. Gender lens is what they apply to all of those concerns. So those are just some samples. Sadly, we still see women's equal participation as a challenge in decision-making. It's really crucial. This was set up during the COVID-19 response. We still don't have gender parity even though women are half the planet, they're only about 25% represented in national parliaments. And sadly, violence against women persists at unacceptably high levels and was intensified during the pandemic, of course. Uh, these are UN figures, very sad numbers here. One in three women, that's 736 million women, have been subjected to physical and or sexual violence at least once in their lifetime since the age of 15. That's a very, very, very sad statistic, but it is a reflection of what the UN has discovered. Lots of young women still at risk. We have to do better. Another point, this is from UNICEF, a quarter of all the world's women alive today were child brides. These are disturbing numbers 
but certainly we're representing a concern around gender equality. There's also the question of availability and sustainability of water for all and sanitation. Pope Francis is very conscious of the water issue. He uses the word 47 times in Laudato. He's very, very concerned about that issue in terms of justice. We should know that the human right to water and sanitation was not really in the goals initially. <clears throat> we worked on it from the point of view of civil society to get it in the preamble. And then it was taken out of the preamble and we had to work to get it back in the preamble. So you can feel the pressure in those rooms. There are forces that are not in favor of these kinds of activities. So human right to water always at risk. And part of the difficulty, as you can see, there's a picture of uh, Kenya. Uh, water has dried up. There's a huge drought in that part of the world. And the people are trying to feed their animals to hole in the ground to find the water. The woman in the bottom of the hole, bringing up the buckets of water. Again, another gender equality question there. 70% of the planet is covered by water. We've seen the photographs from space. It's always a blue marble. So, okay, we got lots of water. However, 0.03%, that's all accessible and drinkable. Even though it looks like there's lots of water in terms of what we can use, very small percentage. Two billion persons lack access to water. Takes 4,000 gallons, that's 15,000 liters, to make a burger. So if you're still eating hamburgers, you should think about it. Takes almost 3,000 gallons of cotton to make a pair of jeans. Cotton is a very water intensive plant. Uh, 10,000 liters of water uh, to make a pair of jeans. And by 2030, we think about half the globe could be facing water scarcity. So you can see why Francis would be concerned about the water question. Now to the, the foundations of the climate crisis, you can see obviously the uh, carbon story. There are three numbers for the carbon story and uh, we'll go with this one. It's 1 1.5, remember that was the Paris Agreement that we're trying to keep the temperature increase uh, below 1.5 Celsius in the Paris Treaty. The number that's there now at 565 gigatons of carbon, that is the Paris budget basically we have that much carbon to burn if we're gonna keep it under 1.5 degrees Celsius. That's all we're allowed to burn because that's what put the uh, planet into uh, higher temperatures. So that's the, as we say, the budget for carbon. And the third number is the scary one, 2,795 gigatons. That's the amount of carbon that the fossil fuel industry has in reserve. We know that by checking uh, their records. And the disturbing part of that is it's about five times as much carbon as we really should be burning. But they have it in the ground somewhere. It's in their reserves when they talk about how much their company is worth. And they intend to uh, basically sell it to us so we can burn it. So you can see our dilemma. We really can't burn more than 565, but we already know we have five times as much ready to go. That's a problem. We have to switch to renewables and do it now. The 2016 warnings, the IPCC, you may be familiar with that, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. That's what the initials stand for. It's the science people behind the thinking in terms of what we are allowed to do. And they have uh, put this little chart out just to give us some help. You can see in the chart, the green line, on the thermostat, 1.5 C, that's what we're limited to by the Paris Agreement. And at Paris, the countries that went to the meeting all said, okay, we're gonna go to make sure we're going to stay under 1.5 C and increase. They were sent home and told, figure out your plan in your country. That is every country had their own, uh, as we call it, goals. And they all did their homework. And then they handed in their homework to the UN, the UN checked the homework and said, okay, if every country does what they promise, we will still be at 3.3 degrees centigrade. So that's not enough, even though if you do everything you promise. And if we don't do anything, that's the yellow line, business as usual, 4.2. Well, these are catastrophic uh, temperatures for the planet. We really can't even contemplate how bad things could be at that point. So we have to get ourselves back to the 1.5. That's our challenge. That was in 2016. So that was uh, seven years ago. 
One five is our goal. Keep one five alive. That's really what we have to do to keep ourselves safe. Now it's 2023, the IPCC runs another assessment, the sixth assessment, and it's talking about the physical science of what's happened. And they're telling us <clears throat> now, um, this was released in March the 20th, so just a few weeks ago. They concluded in a summary, climate change is a threat to human well-being and planetary health. They have very high confidence in that statement. It's almost a certainty. And then there is a rapidly closing window of opportunity to secure a livable and sustainable future for all. Again, very high confidence in that statement from the scientists. So we are in some difficulties here, serious, serious trouble. They are telling us emissions should be decreasing by now and will need to be cut by almost half by 2030 if warming is to be limited to 1.5 C. Very stark assessment. The other part of this problem is it's an inequality question. Back, remember back, we back talked about inequalities and Francis talked about it. Warming is primarily caused by the global rich, is affecting primarily people in the global south. So the justice question comes up. The top 10% of earnings, that's people with more than 35,000 a year, account for about 50% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the planet. Indigenous, people of color, low-income people everywhere, mostly in the global south, already bearing the brunt of the climate crisis. Inequality, again, from Francis. He's told us that. Now we're seeing it at the IPCC level. It's available. Uh, this, this chart is, you know, you can look it up, as they say. You can find out there are also options to reduce emissions. They gave us a map, a way out, with very clear direction. So that's available. That's a link you can go to. We're not going to leave now and go to that link, but you know it's there. It's in the slides. We also have help from Thomas Berry, uh, who's a, a hero of mine in terms of, he said 40 years ago, he was telling us to, to do better. The time has come to lower our voices, to cease imposing our mechanistic patterns on the biological processes of the earth. You can, you can hear echoes here of Laudato to resist the impulse to control, to command, to force, to oppress, and to begin quite humbly to follow the guidance of the larger community on which all life depends. So Thomas had the wisdom even 40 years ago. He has since died, but we certainly wanna look and respect his teachings. Here's some help. This is Mia Motley, Prime Minister of Barbados. This woman is terrific. I bring her to your attention, I lift her up, she is very, very smart, very capable, and fearless about charging uh, the rich countries with what they're doing is wrong. You can see that she's at a podium there. That's at the Glasgow uh, Climate Change Conference uh, two years ago, COP26, and she called them out. She said, you have the money. It's there. You, all you need to do is put a 1% tax on all the fossil fuel transactions in those big corporations and put that in the loss and damage fund for poor nations. Do that, and after one year, you'll have raised $70 billion. So basically, she told them, don't tell me you don't have the money. It's there. So good for her, and I hope she stays at it. <clears throat> the next COP was in 20, COP 27. It was in Egypt. And... It, just a reminder that these uh, COPs are happening. Uh, COP, COP stands for Conference of the Parties. The first COP was in Berlin. The latest one was in Egypt back in November. And it's held every year to discuss and find solutions for climate change. Recall now COP uh, 21 was when we got the Paris Climate Agreement. So we're moving on here. The next COP 28 is gonna take place in United Arab Emirates in this year, in November couple of months from now, Dubai Expo City is chosen for the host location. <clears throat> there is a problem, of course, if you look at this carefully. Uh, will fossil fuels influence the UN at COP28? Well, COP28 is in November. Dubai, Abu Dhabi, is the largest of the seven Emirates. There are uh, obviously United Arab Emirates. There's seven of them. That's the largest one. That's where they're going to have the, the uh, event. The president of the COP is Dr. Sultan Ahmed Al-Jaber. 
He's the designated man who's going to run the COP28 in the United Arab Emirates. There's a picture of uh, Dr. Ahmed Al Jaber. One issue that's probably not being talked about is the fact that he is also the head of the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. So here you have the president of the next COP, who's also the CEO of their national oil company. What could possibly go wrong? There's a challenge. Another one of those issues around UN engagements. We know that uh, sea levels are rising. We know that uh, there's a lot of problems recently. We have a little sample here. This is a map of Greenland in terms of the latest pictures. Left and right. Left is Greenland normally in July. The right was the picture of Greenland in this past July. The red is from a radar sa satellite radar that looked at ice melt. So basically the entire surface of the Greenland ice pack was melting. Didn't mean the whole thing was melting all the way down, but the fact that it's actually all of it in the red is a frightening moment. So vast sheets of ice covering Greenland and Antarctica are melting three times faster than they were even 30 years ago. And this is a disastrous finding according to the people. And again, this slide is available. You can look at the NASA link at the bottom and you can get current information. That's a more disturbing photograph, a radar photograph than we really need to see. But sea level rise is real. Uh, averages about 102 millimeters since 1993. That's in American language is four inches. That's the average for the planet. Uh, recent rates are over uh, the past 2,500 years are unprecedented. We haven't seen this kind of sea level rise for thousands of years. And so four inches, what does that mean? Well, just for uh, people in this part of the world, four inches of sea level rise is like covering the United States in about 16 feet of water or five meters. If all that water was in one place, it's a serious challenge. This is a, a map. This is South Vietnam or the very bottom of Vietnam as we reach the South China Sea. On the left-hand side, you can see uh, pre projections of a yearly, once a year, high tide by 2050. This is a sea level rise challenge. And basically they're saying once a year, Vietnam will have high tides and the blue coloring is where the water will be at high tide once a year. Basically a good chunk of the country. Uh, up here in the uh, corner is Ho Chi Minh City, the capital. There's the South China Sea. However, they revised their projections recently when they got better satellite photographs. And on the right, we can see the result there. Basically, most of the country would be underwater at least once a year by the time we got to 2050. You can see this little tiny black line here. That's the border with Cambodia. So it goes from the South China Sea up to the border with Cambodia once a year flooding. Uh, it's hard to imagine what will be going on there by 2050. That's a country of 99 million people right now. Water conference this March at the UN uh, hasn't happened that often. As a matter of fact, 46 years since they've had a water conference in New York, and they're trying to address this question. They're trying to look at safe water and sanitation. Remember, we talked about 2 billion people don't have access to water and sanitation. At the end of the three days, they had some progress. They had some agreements. They're going to establish a UN special envoy for water, at least put that uh, together. There's also a secretariat for water, so that'll be helpful. And they had 700 voluntary commitments. That's always, a, you know, you roll the dice on that because if it's voluntary, they can always say, well, we really can't do that. So we'll see. But here's another problem, and this is what I hinted at earlier. Uh, corporate participation at... Uh, these conferences is increasing. In Glasgow, the largest delegation was corporate sector, 500 credentialed delegates from corporations. Youth and civil society were too often excluded. In Egypt, the one after that, the poor outcome in Egypt uh, is perhaps unsurprising given the enormous presence that the fossil fuel industry had in Sharm El Sheikh this past year. Global Witness recorded the fact that they found 636 fossil fuel lobbyists had passes to the talks, a presence larger than any country delegation after the United Arab Emirates. You just heard about them a few minutes ago, host of next year's COP. 
There were 25% more fossil fuel lobbyists present than there were at the COP26 in Glasgow. So we need to pay attention to that challenge. This was at the water conference in New York a couple of weeks ago, UN water conference. Here's a sample of the participants who addressed the conference. Bayer Corporation, one of the largest multinational pharmaceutical corporations, yearly revenues of 44 billion euros. InBev, world's largest brewer, and B. Olia, the largest private water provider on the planet. They were all at the water conference in New York. I don't think they were there to push for the common good. They're there for their own purposes. We need to pay attention to these challenges. The Oceans Treaty also this year in New York, slightly better outcome here because the Oceans Treaty uh, was a landmark document, uh, legally binding treaty protecting biodiversity and ensuring the sustainable use of resources in international waters. We finally got language for a treaty. It took us 15 years of negotiations. They finally got it done March the 4th, UN headquarters in New York. That's really an important document. And I'm saying we can get uh, congratulations out to the folks who figured that out. They still have to obviously get it around and get it ratified, but that's huge progress about the oceans because the high seas are about 90% of the habitable space on the planet. 250,000 species, many more we have to find out about. Two thirds of the ocean along with its unique species and ecosystems are in areas beyond national jurisdiction, that ABNJ designation. You know, most countries, if you're a seacoast, you have a 12 mile uh, right to the ocean. And after that, it's, as we say, the wild west. Now they have a treaty to try to control what's going on out there. Uh, it's gonna provide first time protections ever for half the planet. Has not ever had that. That's from Greenpeace, uh, Arlo Hempel, senior campaign manager. That makes it the largest conservation agreement in the history of the world. So good for us, UN, good for us. Now we have more challenges. Gus Speth is a wonderful lawyer. He founded the um, National Resource Defense Council in this country, a very wise man, a good man. And here's what he says. He says, he used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity laws, ecosystem collapse, and climate change. I was wrong. The top problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with these, we need a cultural and spiritual transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Luckily, we have Pope Francis who's helping to show us the way. But you notice that even the science guys and the lawyers say we need cultural and spiritual transformation. What's happening? Here's one problem, banking on climate chaos. This is a recent report. The big banks, as you can see, are accelerating the climate crisis. We're up against some real tough uh, competition here with the big banks. Uh, the report, again, it's on the slide. You can go look at it. World's 60 largest private sector banks, they finance fossil fuels with US $5.5 trillion since Paris. So even since the Paris Agreement, they've been funding fossil fuel exploration. And here are the main culprits for the last six years, how much money has JP Morgan Chase given to fossil fuel projects? $434 billion. That's a lot of money. And they're the big four banks that are funding the fossil fuel industries, even though they say they're trying to do right by care for the earth. We'll see. Uh, this is a hard one to read because it's tiny print, but I'll leave it in the slide deck. It's the Oxfam donut. Basically, in the green, safe and just space for humanity, you can see that framing. The little tight green circle has the social foundation. What do we need? Well, we need food and water and health and income and education, et cetera. And then outside that ring in the environmental ceiling, we have to be careful about fresh water use, climate change, land use, biodiversity loss, those things that are outside the circle. So you see, we have a way of looking at this. We have to stay inside the donut. Laudato will finish with this. Uh, Francis speaking to everybody, all is not lost. He's saying, uh, 
Human beings, while capable of the worst, are also capable of rising above themselves, choosing again what is good, and making a new start. Despite their mental and social conditioning, we are able to take an honest look at ourselves, to acknowledge our deep dissatisfaction, and to embark on new paths to authentic freedom. Francis isn't giving up on us. He's saying no system can completely suppress our openness to what is good, true, beautiful, our God-given ability to respond to his grace at work, deep in our hearts. And he says, I appeal to everyone throughout the world not to forget this dignity, which is ours. No one has the right to take it from us. You can see that paragraph 205, very near the end, he's telling us, don't give up. Some resources will also be left on the slides for you at Iona University. You can click on those links, the Degnan Institute for Earth and Spirit, my work in the Thomas Berry Forum, Ecological Dialogue. And if you want to look at my newsletter, Carbon Rangers, you can click through on that. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Tino. Thank you, everyone. Uh, wonderful to see the exchanges. I agree uh, that uh, the breakout rooms are very helpful because you do get to meet people on a more intimate basis, and I'm grateful that that's happening. So thank you, uh, Tino and uh, Terry and Brian for and Kevin for making that all possible. I have uh, one or two comments just to add, um, because I realize as I get through this material, a lot of times it's uh, it doesn't cheer anybody up. Uh, basically, we have uh, a concern about uh, uh, getting the truth out, and sometimes the truth is difficult. So uh, at this point, I would say uh, the point that Francis made toward the end of his document that uh, there is still hope, or hope all is not lost, is very important to hold on to. I also say this, that uh, the corporation's issue is much more, I think, a New York issue for the UN. I don't have the impression, and maybe I could be corrected by the brothers in Geneva, that the corporations are as present in a visible way in the Human Rights Council as they are at the General Assembly and the ECOSOC Chamber. Um, it's, uh, it's much more obvious of late that they're in the room. And certainly they're at the COP the 500 at, in Glasgow and, and over 600 in Egypt. And now we're gonna be in Abu Dhabi in November. Probably the number will go up even there. So the uh, chances for real progress in, in the COP modem uh, seem less and less likely. That's really my concern there. However, I will say this, I was at the, the water conference. I was at the oceans conference for a couple of days. And I must say, I did not see uh, obvious corporate presence at the oceans deliberations. That was a group of what I call in the old days, worker bees. They worked and they worked and they worked and they were, you know, they worked for governments. They were obviously in state departments or the equivalent for many governments but they were very, very focused on getting a treaty or getting language for a treaty that then could be presented to their governments and be ratified. And that impressed me because I hadn't seen that at the uh, watching the cops from a distance and then watching the water conference. The oceans conversations were different and they were impressive. And I thought those people should be given a lot of uh, thank yous. There was a, a scene there, I think it was uh, Hempel, the, the Greenpeace man was in the rooms. Now those are big rooms, 600, 700 people in a room, it's breakout rooms, there's a lot of conversation going on. Uh, but he said he saw the American Assistant Secretary of State, Monica Medina, asleep on a couch at three in the morning outside one of the rooms. They were working very late at night to get, a degree, to get a document, to get an agreement. That's impressive to me that these are civil servants. They're usually, you know, critiqued by a lot of people as just being uh, civil servants and just bureaucrats, but they tried to get something to happen and it did happen. And they do have a document. It's getting translated now into the languages and it's gonna go around to the member states to get ratified. It's good progress and I'm happy to say 
that it didn't happen without the United Nations. And certainly uh, that's some encouragement despite all the other bad news. So I'll stop there. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Kevin, very much. And Kevin, um, uh, even though you didn't show it in your present presentation, you know, some of the some of the efforts being made, um, for example, that book on with the 400, um, you know, um, uh, uh, you could maybe uh, send me the link to that. And when I'm sending out the resources, I could send that out to everyone. So Brian, over to you. Sorry, Brian, I'll, I'll first go to uh, John Mullen, okay, and I'll make uh, yourself and Terry co-host so that you can unmute yourself. Uh, Kevin Mullen, over to you for any comments, and especially since you were in a breakout group, anything that you picked up to there. Can you unmute yourself, Kevin? No, none of you can unmute yourselves. Okay, one minute. Uh, what can I do about that? Okay. All right. Okay. Uh, Kevin, why don't you go first? Yeah, uh, yeah I'm unmuted now. Thanks, Tino. Okay. Yes, I was in a very interesting group. We had people from India. We had a person from Vietnam. And we had a person from Rome. Uh, they shared some of their experiences. They generally expressed disappointment with kind of what countries were doing in relation to the commitments they made back in 2015, 2016. And they wondered why national governments weren't being challenged more to actually deliver on the things that they promised. That was one of the things that was coming up very strongly in the group. Uh, another thing that I'd mention is that there's going to be a very important summit in September of this year at the UN General Assembly in New York, the SDG Summit. There was a summit back in 2015 when the SDGs were first introduced. And this is now the midpoint of the period from 2015 to 2030. So I think it'll be very important to follow that summit on the 18th and 19th of September. And one of the purposes of the summit is how can they accelerate the implementation of the SDGs? That's the word they're using. They're talking about accelerating the implementation. And preparations are already well underway for that summit. And I know that Ireland is one of the countries that's co-hosting it. So I've been following what Ireland has been doing in preparation for the summit at the UN General Assembly in September. So I leave it like that for the moment, uh, Tino. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Kevin. And uh, over to you. Uh, okay, Terry, I see you unmuted, so I'll go to you first. <clears throat> yeah, a lot of, of the uh, questions in the chat about gender equality and equity, integral equality and human flourishing, yeah, and basically, my very big question is, why are the corporates so powerful at the COP? Is that because they bring money and the UN can profit on that? Whereas the poor old NGOs can't bring money. And my big other question is our whole economic system, when Mia, that Barbados prime minister said 1% tax on fuel, where, what is the role of the World Trade Organization, the IMF, the World Bank, the United Nations General Assembly in implementing these things and forcing trade to bring a 1% tax on all this? Why are they not doing it? Because I think there's politics in the UN, in the General Assembly, and they're in league with the corporates, I think. That's my general assessment. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Terry. Over to you, Brian. Okay, there, there are a couple of uh, comments there about um, the UN challenging multinationals and why the UN is perhaps not taking this issue seriously enough or whatever. Um, just to point out, I mean, when we talk about the UN, uh, um, the UN as an organisation can't compel states or companies or anybody to do to do anything. So it can't impose... Uh, sanctions unless there's a you know a wide agreement among the states but i think the un is taking this issue um environmental concerns seriously for example we spoke about the special procedures um in an earlier presentation and there is a uh, 
a working group on human rights and multinational corporations and other business enterprises. There's also a special rapporteur on human rights obligations relating to the enjoyment of a safe, clean and healthy environment. Um, Kevin asked the question whether there was any obvious presence of uh, multinationals in Geneva, and I would say the answer to that is no. And the other thing I just mentioned is that, um, and this is perhaps on a more encouraging or positive note, um, in 2000, the UN established or launched what is called the UN Global Compact, which is a voluntary initiative, which is based on uh, a commitment of uh, companies to implement sustainable business practices and support the SDGs. And if they sign up to that compact, then they also uh, commit to reporting regularly on progress about implementing the steps towards that. And so far, there's over in excess of 13,000 companies that have uh, uh, signed up to that um, uh, global compact from over 170 countries. So I guess I'm just saying that the news isn't all bad, that's all. I'll leave it at that. <clears throat> It's, thanks very much. It's good to end on a hopeful note, as Kevin Cauley has also been pointing out. And um, I just want to draw the participants' attention to the screen that you're looking at right now. These are the five members of the ERI team. Um, four of us are in uh, Geneva, while Kevin Cauley is based in New York. So uh, on one uh, on one screen, you're getting all five of us right now. So, and I'd like to thank each one of uh, the members over here for playing such a very integral part, uh, a very supportive role in making possible these, um, these four sessions of training. You've seen them on the different sessions. So uh, thank you very much. Much. I'd like to also at this moment, this is our last um, um, Zoom training session for uh, 2023. And I'd like to thank each one of you for participating, being part of it, for um, your presence is always encouraging and motivating for us. And I do hope that uh, those, um, uh, you you have found these sessions uh, useful and that you have made uh, new connections with one another. As I said, I think collaboration is the only way forward and we'll explore how we can do that more closely with each one of you.